Thank you very much to everybody for, uh, for the invitation and for welcoming me today. I'm going to divide so, my brief remarks into, into three sections. First of all, just to provide a bit of context around climate change and the UK's role alongside countries clearly around the world in addressing climate change and the role of the committee itself. Secondly, then a discussion about the airport's commission and the analysis it has, it has undertaken and how it's incorporated climate change into that analysis. And finally, some of the implications uh, for the analysis and for where we are today. Just before kicking off with those remarks, despite my billing, it's obviously important to say that I'm not here representing the environmental community in, uh, in any capacity. I'm here as the chief executive of the Committee on Climate Change, which has a particular role that I'll come on to and a particular set of legal and statutory responsibilities around, around climate change. So first of all, what is that context? The, uh, as, many as, you, as many of you will know, the Climate Change Act sets a target for the UK as part of its contribution to global efforts to tackle climate change. That target is that greenhouse gas emissions in the UK will have fallen by 80% relative to 1990 levels by the time we reach 2050. Achieving that target of a, at least 80% reduction is consistent with action across a whole, all the sectors in the economy. And every single sector is contributing to, through technological advances, through changes to how it works, through changes to how industrial processes work, changes to how transport works, every single sector contributing to how we're going to achieve that 80% reduction. We do that in a very careful step-by-step -step way. And one of the most important roles of the Committee on Climate Change is to set out what the most cost-effective path looks like to that 2050 target. We do that through a series of what are called carbon budgets. Every five years, there's a carbon budget similar to the budget that the government sets every five years for in its spending review context. And that carbon budget sets out the levels of greenhouse gases that we as a country can emit. Last week, I was in Parliament with the, with the new Parliament and with the new government setting out the committee's progress report for where we are up to now. And one of the important facts about 2014, the last year that we saw, was that eco the economy grew. The economy grew by 2.8%. Manufacturing grew. Manufacturing grew by about 3%. And greenhouse g gas emissions fell. Greenhouse gas em emissions fell by about 8%. And it's that type of outcome which we're looking to achieve by going through systematically step by step to the 2050 target, whereby we can continue economic growth while maintaining reductions in greenhouse gases along the way. Aviation is no exception to that trend in most respects. And so we looked a number of years ago specifically at aviation sector and tried to understand what its contribution needed to be towards achieving that 2050 target recognizing a number of the quite unique aspects of the aviation sector, not least the international environment that it operates in, not least the types of trade links and the economic benefits that, that Katia and others were just speaking about, as well as the large demands and growth uh, that's happening in aviation. And the conclusion that the committee came to, having weighed and balanced a whole range of evidence, is that meeting those 2050 greenhouse gas emissions targets is consistent with a growth in demand of aviation relative to 2005 of about 60%. So demand can grow about 60% from 2005 levels out to 2050 and still be consistent with meeting our 80% reduction by 2050 greenhouse gas targets. That's given the range of technological progress, given the range of innovation that we expect to see in airplanes, in airports, in fuels, and a range of other factors in aviation over the next, over the next period. That level of growth is compatible with rising greenhouse gas emissions relative to the 1990 baseline. And so aviation emissions have risen about 120% since 1990. And so recognizing the growth in aviation, but that technological change from 2005 will allow demand to continue growing whilst aviation emissions remain flat out to 2050. So that's the context with which, we, with which we view and with which the committee has to work with regards to both the statutory targets in 2050 and aviation in particular. So what has been the job of the, aviation, of the airports commission within, within that context? The job of the airports commission then, amongst many others, has been to look and to assess the business case for expansion, first in the southeast and then clearly across the different options that were before it 
look at the business case for expansion in the context of those climate change commitments and, as you've heard today, in the context of other uh, commitments around noise, around air quality, and other areas. The Airports Commission has concluded that expansion in the southeast and, uh, more recently, at Heathrow is consistent with meeting those greenhouse gas commissions, uh, those greenhouse gas uh, commitments, and that the business case still stacks up under those conditions. That's not a job for us as the committee. The job for us as the committee is to clearly set out what those, what those constraints require and what the legal obligations actually are. The Airports Commission has concluded that a business case still exists with those constraints. I guess a slightly different way of putting that, that question is whether and how the Airports Commission has incorporated those carbon constraints into its analysis. The Airports Commission has probably very sensibly said that it doesn't know precisely what regime will exist in 2050 when it comes to aviation emissions. Those are clearly under discussion in the context of the international negotiations at the International Civil Aviation Organization and elsewhere currently. They will no doubt be taken up following the big international negotiations in Paris at the end of this year. So the Airports Commission doesn't know exactly what regime will exist in 2050, and therefore it's been relatively conservative in its analysis, and it said, what happens if this strict constraint over aviation emissions, keeping them at 2005 levels consistent with a 60% growth in demand between 2005 and 2050, what happens if that strict constraint is applied to the UK? And they conclude that there is still the business case, the benefits to business still exist with that constraint in place. So what are the implications of, of that set of analysis and where does that leave us today? First of all, it's important to say clearly that everybody is signed up to and understands the legal obligations that we're under with respect to our efforts to tackle climate change. It's been clear in the advice that the Committee on Climate Change has given. It's been clear in the analysis that the Airports uh, uh, Commission has undertaken. And the government, both the new government and previous governments, have been clear in their commitments to the Climate Change Act and to meeting the implications of the Climate Change Act and the emissions reductions that will be required. And so we're acting today in full knowledge of those, of those commitments. And those commitments, the analysis suggests, are compatible then with expanding in the southeast and with the business case that's been put forward for Heathrow and has been uh, supported by the Airports Commission. In the, uh, in the report that the Committee on Climate Change laid before Parliament and to the new government last year, in that context, we were clear about what the next sets of actions are with respect to, to climate change and our efforts to tackle climate change. First of all is for the British government to set out quite clearly the sets of policies that it think will be compatible in aviation with achieving those greenhouse gas limits by 2050. And secondly, that the government acts clearly alongside governments around the world in the context of the negotiations both in Paris and at ICAO next year in 2016 to come to an international agreement that ensures that this is workable in an international context such that aviation emissions can make their contribution towards tackling climate change from 2050 and beyond. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much. Two questions here, possibly. Yes. One, two. Thank you. Um, can you uh, put Could you say context? who you are yeah, and where sorry, you are? Sorry, I beg your pardon. Chris Sergeant from Green Air Online. Um, UK domestic aviation emissions are included at the moment in the, uh, in the carbon budget. What is the position with international emissions? I think you have recommended to government that they should be included, but as yet, um, is it a case of waiting to see what happens on the international scene, first of all? So you're, you're right to say that there's, there's a distinction, in fact, between UK domestic aviation emissions, so flights within the UK, flights within Europe and European aviation emissions, and then flights more broadly internationally. Um, the, the way in which the Climate Change Act works is that there is both a 2050 target on greenhouse gas emissions, the 80% reduction, and then this series of carbon budgets leading up to 2050. The clear position is that the 2050 target includes aviation emissions. The carbon budgets leading up to those, and this is just a quirk of the legal framework, don't include aviation emissions. And so when we're reporting on each of these five yearly carbon budgets, they officially don't include anything other than the UK's domestic aviation emissions. 
But we know that we have to be on this path towards 2050, where at which point international aviation missions are included. And so, at which, and so we track aviation emissions, and we always show in our analysis of the carbon budgets the contribution of aviation emissions. In between those international ones and the domestic ones, European, intra-Europe aviation emissions are already included in the European emissions trading scheme, and so are already, in effect, taken into account there. And the missing piece of the puzzle, which is the biggest source of aviation emissions, is fitting in how that international framework is then going to work in order to help us along that path to 2050. And that's clearly a lot of the work that should be done over the next 12 months in an international arena, of which the British government is clearly only one player, but it's important it plays a big role in that. Yeah. Uh, Brian Ross, Substance the Expansion. Um, if he throws to have a third runway and aviation emissions have to be held flat at, I think it's 37.5 million tonnes of carbon to 2050, does that mean that growth at regional airports will need to be um, constrained or stifled? And there's a second part. The Commission also suggested there could be scope and demand for a second additional runway somewhere in the UK by 2050. Would that be containable within the climate change uh, targets? Thank you. So the, the, commi the Committee on Climate Change doesn't take a specific position on which power plants and electricity generating plants to build, on which particular roads to build, on which particular railways to build, or on which particular airports to build. All of those decisions are decisions to be taken by private investors in responding to market signals, often in collaboration with sector regulators and a range of other factors. The it's not the role of the Committee on Climate Change to make specific recommendations about particular projects. It is our role to be very clear and to set out the path that overall UK emissions have to take in order to hit that 2050 target in a cost-effective way. And the government, as, uh, um, as we made clear last week as well, can decide to depart from that cost-effective route if it wants to um, and should set out why it's doing that and how it's doing that. And so in that context, we've been very clear, as you said, about the 37.5 million tons that we think is consistent with aviation making its contribution to that cost-effective path. That is, uh, that requires, if you imagine every other sector, is not holding its emissions constant from 2005 levels. Every other sector, whether the power sector or transport or agriculture, or construction, every other sector is having to reduce its emissions year on year in order to hit that 80% reduction. And so it take that 37 and a half limit on aviation takes into account lots of the features of aviation. And so we've put that piece of analysis out there, and we've been clear about the implications for 2050. It is then up to individual investors and individual decision makers, whether it's the airports commission or the government or others, to make decisions then in the context of the legal obligations around 2050 that the Climate Change Act creates. Hugh Thomas, Foster and Partners. If we have, in effect, um, the ability to grow our aviation emissions by 60% by 2050, and that is a legal limit, the decision currently taken, or the recommendation proposed by the Airports Commission, suggests that with uh, background growth at other airports and the creation of a third runway at Heathrow, that would be how we would spend that 60% extra capacity. At the point that those airports are full, we've used up all that we can expend. If there is more demand, what happens? So, so first of all, to be clear, the 60% uh, the refers to growth in demand, not growth in emissions. And so we can grow demand by 60% from 2005 levels to 2050. And given the evidence that we've seen and the analysis that we've seen, we believe that given, there's, given technological change and changes in aircraft and changes in airports and fuels and that, that will take place between 2005 and 2050, that 60% increase in demand is consistent with no increase in emissions from aviation from the UK over that period. Now, technological change and innovation are things that is hard to predict, and we revisit our analysis frequently, and I'm sure everybody else will be revisiting the analysis over the coming decades in order to make adjustments as, as, things, as things move forward. Then there's a separate question, as you say, there's a separate question about the, the, uh, the pressures on the system and the growth in demand. Our analysis, as I said, suggests that that 60% growth in demand is consistent with not only the efforts to tackle climate change, but the efforts to grow GDP and to continue growth 
uh, across the whole si size of the economy. That's the analysis that's, been, that's taken place to date, and that's the analysis that then the, the Airports Commission has used in order to come to its conclusions about the runways in the southeast. As I said, in response to the previous question, we don't take a particular view on particular airports around, around the country. Uh, we're taking a view about the UK as a whole and the set of emissions that are consistent with meeting that 2050 target. Okay, thank you. There was one question just there, please. Thank you. The gentleman there. Is there anyone I'm missing? Is there one at the back there? Yes, okay. I'll come to you shortly. Uh, hello. Uh, Jock Lowe, retired pilot. Um, I, I just um, wonder if there's a recognition that aviation can pretty well only use liquid hydrocarbon fuels. There's, there's no other way. Even moving on to hydrogen in 50, 60 years' time is unlikely. So we have a problem in that we'll keep producing carbon dioxide. Therefore, has any thought been given to the fact that you can do a trade? It prices put into the commission report, and indeed the prices looking forward as to the price of carbon traded. Uh, it could well be much cheaper for the avi aviation industry to do carbon capture and storage. And, and the Amin solution is 100 years old, but it still works, and that's without any developments. So would you see it as an acceptable trade, and indeed my most part a solution, if the equivalent amount of carbon dioxide put out was captured from some other source and stored? So you're, you're right to point out that clearly there are, there are limited alternatives to how you're going to fuel aircraft. Um, certainly one of the ones that's being looked at in much more detail these days is liquid biofuels and how you use biofuels in a sustainable way as part of aviation's contribution to reducing its, its greenhouse gas emissions. But then you're right also to point out that there are a range of other uh, ways that aviation emissions effectively could be offset, of which carbon capture and storage is potentially one. What's, what's clearly important in that context is that any offsetting that the aviation sector does is genuinely additional to offsetting that would happen anyway. And so as some of you are probably aware, there are carbon capture and storage pilots projects and initial projects about to be up and running uh, in the power sector, capturing greenhouse gas emissions from electricity generation and storing them. Uh, there are a range of initiatives in a range of other sectors. And what's important in any of these offsetting regimes is that the contribution the aviation sector is making is additional to the contributions other sectors are making so that we don't get into a situation of double counting sort of the same bit of, of, uh, of carbon that we've avoided. But within that context, um, those kinds of schemes should clearly be looked at. And that's the, the reason why I think in some ways uh, the Airports Commission has been careful about how it's... Uh, done its analysis when it comes to the climate change commitments because it said it's not quite sure what types of regimes, technologies, offsetting arrangements will exist in 2050. And so it's taken a very strict line and said emissions are going to be limited to the 37 and a half million tons. And it still believes that the business case stacks up even against that, uh, that constraint. Okay, thank you. And then there's a, uh, a woman there, please. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Yes, Friends of the Earth again, uh, the London campaigner. Um, obviously, your carbon cap, the 37.5 million tonnes, is, is one thing. And, and um, as you say, other sectors would have to do a lot more, 85% on average, to, to achieve um, the 60% the, um, um, to allow the 60% growth in, in aviation. And at that point in 2050, aviation would represent a quarter of all our greenhouse gas emissions, which is extraordinary. But the reality is, is that really, are you really satisfied that that is achievable? Because the carbon um, cap cost would have to be so enormous and the reality of the other sectors achieving even 80%, let alone 85%, is surely um, pie in the sky. So, as, um, so first of all, some background for everybody else. As I said, the, the 2050 target is to reduce the UK's greenhouse gas emissions by, 80, by at least 80% by 2050. The implications of everything that we've been talking about for aviation and the fact, as people have pointed out, the difficulties and the cost of reducing greenhouse gases uh, from the aviation sector has led the Committee on Climate Change 
to, uh, to model more emissions from aviation in 2050 than from other sectors. And the implications, as you rightly point out, is that other sectors have to make reductions not of 80%, but indeed of 85% in order to allow the growth in aviation that we think is, is appropriate. Um, second part of the question then is about do we think that we can achieve this outcome in 2050? Clearly, the Committee on Climate Change, having done all the analysis, having seen the set of evidence that it's seen, having uh, turned over the numbers and received the evidence from a wide range of sectors, thinks that we're setting out a path towards 2050 that is consistent with what is achievable, not just in aviation, but in the power sector or in transport more broadly in agriculture and elsewhere. At the same time, just because we can set out what a cost-effective path looks like doesn't mean that we know precisely the technological or demand size solutions that are going to be applied at every step of the way. We're talking about several decades in the future and lots of things will happen and we will continue reviewing the evidence and clearly that's why we keep reporting back on an annual basis to Parliament and to the government and we will keep reviewing that. As I stand here today, we have set out to the mid-2020s fairly precisely what has to happen, and we have the 2050 target. At the end of this year, the committee will set out what it thinks is the next step in that, in that process, which is the period from 2028 to 2032, and we heard that if the, uh, if the Airports Commission's recommendations are taken up, new runway will be well under construction and, uh, and probably exist. And as part of our advice at the end of this year, we'll be setting out what we think emissions should look like in that period around 2030, consistent with the, uh, the airport's commission's advice and consistent with where we think we are. And clearly we think that there's a step-by-step -step way of, uh, of achieving those outcomes and achieving the outcomes that we're looking for. In the same way as, you know, if you were sitting here, probably not without microphones, without all this technology, if we were sitting here in 1900, I saw the other day a picture of a uh, street in New York, actually, a street in New York around 1900, full of horses and carts. You could spot one or two cars in the street, but mainly it was full of all horses and carts. And you could look at that picture and you could say, well, I'm not precisely sure how we're going to go from all these horses and carts to all these cars, but I'm pretty confident of the direction of travel. And surely enough, 15 years, only 15 years later, the same picture, the same street, not a horse and cart in sight, but lots of cars. And I'm not precisely sure, and the Committee on Climate Change will never claim it's precisely sure about how we're going to go from where we are today to 2050. But we're going to make incremental progress and in our annual advice to the government based on that incremental progress about the least cost, most cost-effective way of getting to 2050. And you can be fairly confident with what you see today. You can see the things emerging that we will get there even if we're not precisely sure of the route that we'll take.